Expedition to the Barrier Peaks, The Keep on the Borderlands, Ravenloft. These legendary adventures have withstood the test of time. Yet, there is one module that towers above the rest. A module that doesn't simply challenge the characters, but also inflicts psychic damage upon the players themselves. The Tomb of Horrors. What makes this module so notorious in the first place? And why has it captivated players for decades? The module is so iconic that Ernest Klein featured it in his book, Ready Player One. I was a little disappointed when the movie replaced the dungeon with a race, though at least it was referenced on the back of H's van. Speaking of that same reference, I was at a trading card shop the other day and noticed that same reference there, sitting ominously right next to the cash register. Skipping ahead a bit, but this is a direct reference to the infamous face of the Great Green Devil found at the start of the Tomb of Horrors. Its mouth is akin to a sphere of annihilation. You don't want to put your hand in that. Regardless, this wasn't real, so of course I did. I mean, wouldn't you? It even comes with some dice. Let's see what's inside. Anyhow, given that it's that time of year to watch spooky movies and dress up, I'm, I'm going as uh, an adventurer myself, but given how this looks, uh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm more, I'm more literary writing critic this time around, but uh, I digress. I've invited three D&D YouTubers to tackle the advanced original Dungeons & Dragons 1E version of the Tomb of Horrors exactly as written. Now, none of us have actually played this edition of Dungeons & Dragons, it's just that old for us. So I decided to pick up reproduction copies of the Player's Handbook and the Dungeon Master's Guide just to learn how to play the system. And while I was at it, I also picked up a reproduction copy of the Tomb of Horrors because despite the fact that I own the real thing, I'd rather not destroy it or damage it in any way making this video. And this should really give us a good opportunity to find out what the original Tomb of Horrors was all about and why it's become so infamous. And truly, they have no idea what they've signed up for. But before we jump into the module, maybe I should review it first just to get an idea as to what we're up against. On the cover, we can see that the module was written for Dungeons & Dragons tournaments, but not tournaments like you might be thinking. Instead, these were kind of like speedrunning video games today. At a convention, a bunch of teams would compete to see who could get the furthest within the allotted amount of time, which, I guess, explains the start of the Tomb of Horrors. Just to get to the entrance of the dungeon, the players must walk around randomly, stabbing the ground with a 10-foot pole or spear in the hopes of finding it. If they somehow ascend 200 feet into the sky, they can spot a human skull etched into the side of the mountain. Though, to me, it just looks like a jack-o'-lantern. Now, how they're supposed to accomplish getting into the sky, I haven't a clue. Must have just been a common thing back in those days to naturally ascend up into the sky and fly about everywhere. Whatever. Now, depending on where they poke the hole, west, north, or east, they'll get to one of three entrances to the dungeon. Except not really, because two of them are fake. Yeah, that's right, the east and west entrance are entirely fake. They only serve to waste to the player's time. Now this makes sense for a tournament setting, but as I'm just wanting the players to experience the dungeon itself, I think I'm gonna have to make an adjustment here. So AD&D 1E Tomb of Horrors as written, except no false dungeon entrances. Moving on. Ah, so there's a lot of traps, which essentially lead to an instant death without any forewarning. For instance, if the player ends up in the Forsaken Prison, they'll have three levers in front of them to adjust. Pushing all three of them upwards reveals a trap door in the ceiling they can use to escape. But pushing all three downward opens a pitfall trap that deals 10d10 damage as the players fall 100 feet. The module doesn't mention there being a way out of here, so I assume any character that gets here is stuck here for the rest of their life. Nice. And how do the players know which direction to pull the levers? Pure random luck. Therefore, in instances where the players must make a choice of life or death without the book giving them any clues as to a solution, and the failure results in death, I'll instead have their character take 1d6 damage and be teleported back to the entrance of the dungeon. This is already used elsewhere in the book, so it shouldn't feel that out of place. 
All right, so AD&D 1E as written, except no false dungeon entrances and no untelegraphed instant deaths. Another frustrating element of the Tomb of Horrors, which seems to strictly waste the player's time and not actually help them progress the dungeon, is the idea of hidden exits to hidden tunnels. For most hidden paths, players must discover some obscure method to reveal the tunnel. Once they enter and reach the end, they find it's a dead end, except not really. To perceive a hidden panel that reveals the exit, depending on the trap, they need to roll either like a one or a two on a D6 to succeed. Now, I ask you, why? Players have already gone through all of the necessary steps to find a hidden tunnel, and, and they're quite obscure, trust me on this. There's simply no need to be this obtuse. Therefore, our final list of modifications are as follows. AD&D 1E Tomb of Horrors as written, except no false dungeon entrances, no untelegraphed instant deaths, and no hidden exits to already hidden passageways. These adjustments ought to remove all of the tournamentifications done to the module simply to waste the player's time or potentially soft lock them into giving up, ensuring that it strictly challenges their wits and not needlessly wastes their time. And with that, I think we're ready to meet our test subjects. <laughs> Sorry, I mean players. All right, I'm Jacob Crow, and today I am playing as Dante Shadow Walker, who introduces himself uh, as his valet is fanning him as a uh, <laughs> trail by what can only be assumed as a, a large caravan. Uh, naturally, as an assassin, his weapon of choice is a uh, two handed longsword, which of course is the nine life stealer. I am Alex Legal Kimchi. I am playing Fidget Wigglefingers, and he seems utterly annoyed by the valet and caravan <laughs> that follows this party around. I'm playing Iliam of the Badlands. She's an older, sort of stern-faced looking woman with a bit of a drinking problem. Okay, so an edgelord, a wannabe cowboy, and a drunk. Perfect. And now that character introductions are out of the way, Aserarak has a message for our players. A hint as to the puzzles found within his dungeon. Aserarak congratulates you on your powers of observation. So make of this whatever you wish, for you will be mine in the end, no matter what. Go back to the Tormentor or through the Arch. In the second great hall you'll discover, shun green if you can, but knight's good color is for those of great valor. If she... Hot, but a loop of magical metal, you are well along on your march. Two pits along the way will be found to lead to a fortuitous foil. So, check the wall. And beware of trembling hands and what will ball. If you find the false, you find the true. And into the column tall you'll come. And there, the throne that's key and keyed. The art is I. You've left and left and found my tomb, and now your soul will die. Who knew a Sarak could be such a poet? And how merciful was he to give such a hint? I mean, the players only needed to stare at the floor for a while to spot the runes there, and then spend even more time deciphering them, only to have a really crappy hint provided to them. You know what, at least it happened. At least a hint was given to the players. A Sarak could have just not done that, right? He could have just, you know, he could have just let them go in there blind and, and suffer, you never know. Anyhow, well, you know what, why dwell on the past? Let's see how our players did. And let's just say, one of them had a very interesting time. So, this very buff and manly rogue falls on his ass and gets pulled up. Basically, you've triggered a trap, so you've now opened a, a hidden path. I'm going to bring one miner in. I'm bringing the ass in, obviously. Hey, Dante, get out of the room. <laughs> I'm going to walk out of the room with the uh, miner, and I leave the other miner inside uh, uh, with an O. I leave the lantern boy to pull the... <laughs> As he pulls it, the floor gives out, and he falls about 30 feet down onto some spikes and takes 3d6 damage. Ooh. As you open up the other side of the door, you see, or rather hear, a large growl and are greeted by a four-armed gargoyle. Oh, my, my magical hand gestures are... <laughs> I'm a 10th level spellcaster throwing a fireball, so that's 10d6. You hear like just a, a very large, you know, intake of breath and then a collapse onto the ground. Well, that seems like it was about it. I'm going to open the door. Uh, you reveal another door and a little space. Where you see someone 
you reveal another door. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine. He walks over to the door. I'm gonna open the door. You reveal a hidden passage back to the room he came from. Wow, you found it. I'm gonna kill him. Out of frustration, I walk to this door and just open it. I run through the mist door. <laughs> you move back to the start of the dungeon, but not with any of your items or clothing. You're buck ass naked. So as you as you like bamf into the start of the dungeon, like three chickens, three cocks come flying out from the side of you, and then you're naked there, and then <laughs> surrounded by three cocks and nine asses. <laughs> And then all of like uh, Dante's little mercenary group is like, what in the nine hells? Okay, everything until now has been all fun and games, but this next room came within a dice roll of a TPK. Literally, all three of them almost died and they didn't even know it. And uh, well, just see for yourselves. So you're touching the altar. As he touches this, a bolt of lightning, like the light shoots out. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Holy crap, I would have oh died. My God. You <laughs> detect that there probably is some sort of a trap here. I'm gonna sit down on this pew right here. Sure. I'm gonna reach over my 10 foot pole and I'm gonna try to lift the lid. Uh, <laughs> a, a green gas of some sort starts to expel from the bottom of the seat. You've activated its trap card <laughs> that this room is entirely going to be filled with gas in about 10 seconds. I, I actually stay, I stay sitting. Yeah, I have an amulet that makes me immune to any kind of gas-based effect. No way. <laughs> just having a nice time. Kimchi, on the other hand, is a glutton for punishment. So you step <laughs> in for, you step into this misty portal and literally nothing happens. You've not been teleported anywhere. You do feel like some extra weight is now on your chest area. And, oh, no. and you look, I, know, I know what's happening here. You look down and you have been cursed. You are now female. Because of the route you just took, that you're cursed, this gas doesn't hurt you. You just lose strength for two days. Oh my God. As he, as he breathes it in. So Acerac first transes your gender, then he gasses you with Well, to be fair, drain. he didn't gas him, you gassed him. You're the okay. one who triggered it. All right, all right. Bob. You didn't know I what didn't. you were doing. You were playing with I fire there. I didn't, okay. So to recap thus far, Dante, our resident edgelord, got a henchman killed, fumbled a trap for an hour, and then released gas upon the entire party before bolting and saving his own butt. Fidget YOLO'd into everything. Like literally a wizard face checked every possible trap without checking first. He suffered an excruciating puzzle run, set off a trap that dealt 20 damage to the entire party, could have very well dealt 40 damage, but they all passed to their magic save, and got cursed to have his gender changed and his alignment also flipped which I don't reveal in the video, but did happen. And then to cap it all off, that gas when it hit him rolled exactly to reduce his strength to one. Uh, so now he's got like noodle arms. He can't really do anything. Oh, sorry. She can't really do anything. And then Ilium just sat there in the back and kind of just watched these two make fools of themselves. So in one three person party, I think we experienced the full spectrum of player personality. And that's it. We played for four hours and got through about half the dungeon. And unfortunately, we've not been able to meet up again to continue. So this is where we stand as of today. But I have had a chance to follow up with our three players individually since. And to make an already long story shorter, the census was that the adjustments I made actually made the Tomb of Horrors an enjoyable experience. And I agree. There's no need to cut out large swaths of the dungeon or make puzzles easier or give more hints. Simply cutting out the elements that were written for tournament play made it, dare I say, fun? Well, at least tolerable. As simple and strange as that is to say about such an infamous module. On that note, if you'd like to actually see the full adventure with Dante, Fidget, and Ilium in the Tomb of Horrors, we're currently trying to work out when we can meet up again to finish the module. And once that's done, I'll edit the whole thing and put it up for everyone to view. Removing all the boring bits, of course, because again, none of us have actually played AD&D 1E, so there was a lot of, you know, looking up rules. When that'll happen, who knows? Now, if you've made it to the end, you've probably noticed I've not put out any videos for about a year and a half. It'd mean a lot for me if you were to leave a like, 
and subscribe because I'm trying to build back up my channel again from such a hiatus. But if you don't want to, don't worry about it. And if you'd rather binge some of my older, a little bit of a different style videos, uh, here's a few that YouTube would recommend for you.